Todd Howard has uh, essentially directly responded to some of people's concerns and questions in an interview with IGN. And of course, it's one of these situations. It's a Bethesda game. A certain Crobcat video is obviously playing in the back of people's minds, and that's all very funny. But uh, let's actually go in to Todd addressing some of the concerns, uh, concerns that people had. I think the number one concern that we saw across many of the gaming blogs, tweets, YouTube, etc., is, okay, Thousand Planets, gray No Man's Sky, boring, don't give a shit, procedural muck, blech. Yeah, Which is what yeah. some people just, you know, instantly fast th- thought their way to. Yeah, I mean, that's the whole thing, right? In the void of information, you kind of draw your own conclusion, and for a lot of people, that's the worst case scenario, especially if they're particularly cynical, or if they wanted to like Fallout 76 and couldn't, you could sort of see what yeah. they would train that way. Or but if yeah. they skim read headlines. Exactly. That, exactly. you know, they skim yeah. read, uh, read headlines, they read tweets that are not uh, accurately capturing the what's actually being communicated about the game. All these things that I think those of us who at least try to be a little bit on the money about things online, you know, we get a little bit, like, disgruntled (laughs) whenever uh, things just end up being so sort of low precision. So let's head into it then. Of course, one of the last-minute reveals was the number of planets, the scale, and that obviously meant there was a lot of questions. So Todd spoke directly to this. He essentially said, right, You want to do a planet. How do you do a planet? Well, whether you are called Star Citizen or Starfield or No Man's Sky, you're going to be doing some form of procedural generation. And in fact, procedural generation for things like this, that has been one of the most common final year projects Hmm. in computer science people, software engineer people, game development people that they will do in university. Mine was shit. But it's what I tried. It's just a very normal thing. So, yes, procedural generation is absolutely what you would use here. Now, the thing is, then, once you have your procedural generation going, it's very easy to just make more. You know? Um, Even in the shitty little system I built, I could just increase the number of planets like that. Look at all that content. Repurposed my planet system to make an (laughs) asteroid field. Click. Done. Yep. Very simple. Uh, it's why in No Man's Sky, you get such a humongous variety of planets now, and it's a lot more variety than you will maybe think of if you only played the game at launch, uh, off ultimately one system, right? So if you want to do 10 planets or 100 planets or 1,000 planets, that's actually exceedingly easy to do, which is kind of crazy. And of course, procedural tools are used all across uh, the industry and in Bethesda's games. They have, in fact, been using procedural generation since Oblivion, which... Yeah. To anyone who's played those games, I think won't be a surprise. There's no way you're hand making all of that stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone's fine. Uh, you know, you look in Oblivion, you're like, P- they didn't plant all of these trees in this forest manually. They went, there's some forest, work away, work yeah. away. And that's fine because that was intentionally empty forest that then they dropped a couple things in. And there you go. Yeah, and then of course the thing is, well, do you make good on that procedural content? How does that fit into the game? And that's one of the things that Todd, I think, really does try to communicate to people here. Yeah. Um, so he does say that while there is all this talk about the, the proc gen stuff, there is in fact more handcrafted content in this game than any game they have done before. <laughs> right? So he says there are 200,000 lines of dialogue. That's just such a high... No- As an that's example, crazy. we recently passed for our game 250,000 words. Uh, so just here's Bethesda, 250,000 lines. Holy shit. Um, so that's a lot of handcrafted content, right? So he essentially said for the people who just want to do all the handcrafted content, right? Where, you know, they want to do the main quest, do the quest lines. Basically, they are going to get what they will expect from a Bethesda uh, experience. The difference is that there's another dimension, which here's how Todd puts it. Well, I'm just going to wander uh, this planet. It's going to provide some gameplay, some random content, and those kind of things. Kind of like a Daggerfall would if you go way back. Of course, the Elder Scrolls to Daggerfall is the size of the UK. Yeah, it was... Literally. It was remarkable for being one of the biggest games of all time. But it was a very big and very empty game. <laughs> but you did just kind of go around and see if something maybe happened. Which is kind of key to like, it's like I was kind of talking a little bit in our last video about it, like the fantasy of playing it. And that's the thing where I think the main quest and stuff is all very good content. And that was like, that was kind of where the meat of like New Vegas was an example. Yeah. But then you look at this, you're kind of, if you have the means to support enough procedural generation that gives people actual, the ability to have that gameplay. I think that's kind of where people highlight the idea of playing something a little bit off kilter. 
something like I think one of the things they had was like the chef starting background, so you were good with knives. And that's going to be something that's fairly a little bit difficult to get procedural generation wise in terms of how much can you, you know, get your ability to hand someone some nice cooking to get you, you know, through a random door on a random planet in somewhere nice. And that's going to be the difficult thing to do. But for most things, it is just going to be the case of just have to make sure that there's enough going on that people can explore and feel there's at least stuff happening. Yeah. And if you take a game like No Man's Sky, yeah. there's a lot of fun exploration. People yeah. will enjoy finding planets that look cool, finding a part in that planet that they can build a base on, right? Like maybe yeah. they want to build their supervillain lair at the side of a volcano. They will do a whole bunch of searching and exploring to actually find that within the game. So I think the big question here is what are their worlds going to be like? Mm. As an example, at one point we saw a pretty cool looking jungle world. Is that going to be the sort of world that we can expect from the procedural generation system? Or is that more in-depth stuff a little bit more limited to the handcrafted worlds. I think ultimately what they want though is that when you are going through this quest and all these side quests and stuff, that it's not happening in this sort of hyper compressed space. That is something that quite a few people I know found to be immersion breaking or just they didn't really like that much about um, the outer worlds, right? Yeah. So if you're kind of doing all that, but in the backdrop of just literally, you can go to that planet and do a thing. Hmm. For a lot of people, that just makes the experience cool. A really good example, like take a star citizen. It might take 10 minutes to fly from you know this bit and this star system to another uh, planet uh, in the same star system. And a lot of people say, 10 minutes, that's very boring. But the people who will enjoy a game like that will say, well, no, to me, actually, 10 minutes is really cool because I feel like I'm actually in a big star system. Yeah. This actually feels so cool and so authentic to me. And it also does kind of have some impacts for at least uh, Star Citizen on its game economy, on risk, on fuel, and things like that. So it's not going to be there for everybody, but I think for a lot of people, it will be quite good. Now, hmm. on the lines of dialogue, we actually have some comparisons here. Uh, thanks to Pass Nibble, who's pointing out that Fallout 4 had 111,000 lines of dialogue. Skyrim had uh, 60,000. And uh, yeah, basically the end of September last year, they were at about 150,000 lines of dialogue. So it's a lot you of writing. Can, yeah, a lot of writing. You can just see that content train going. I mean, the idea of Skyrim having 60,000, and to be fair, Skyrim does have a lot of repeated dialogue. Everyone will yep. meme about, you know, Oblivion and Skyrim having, like, <laughs> guards of, like, two lines and just repeat them. But that's, I mean, literally over three times the size of Skyrim in terms of lines of dialogue. And, I mean, obviously there's a lot of lines of dialogue you can write where, you know, you go, okay, every NPC has an extra 10 that they can use in combat. And that kind of bulks out a little bit. But in terms of it having more handcrafted content, that just seems like we've got a ton more actual literal quests to do. Which would make sense in terms of how like modern games are sized because obviously you look back at Skyrim and go well, that game was absolutely massive but then you look at something like a well I guess maybe Zero Dawn wasn't super massive it's pretty big but like Horizon Forbidden West or something and that game is unbelievably huge and Starfield they're not going to let their what because they used to be the biggest mm. they're not going to just be like oh, we'll be normal now they're going to still want to be the biggest yeah I think much of the point too is just the the tools yeah like all that stuff is so much better now For so sure. many more people have made procedural generation systems mm -hmm. and there's just more knowledge out there there is more papers or talks from like the SIGGRAPH uh, mm -hmm. conference to reference right there's just yeah. so much more that people can do now um, so to continue on what Todd's been talking about though because you don't want to get confused about what's procedural what's not yeah because then you could end up in these positions where players are looking for one thing they're literally barking up the wrong tree they don't enjoy the game well, he said, we're careful to let you know that's what procedural content is. So if you look at space, you know there's going to be a load of ice balls in space. So that was one of our big design considerations. What's fun about an ice ball? And it's okay sometimes if ice balls aren't. It, it is what it is. And as somebody, yeah. I will, I'm coming in here as the person who's specifically interested in a, not a realistic, no, definitely not, an <laughs> authentic feeling space game. Yeah, I want there to be the capacity to be a boring ice ball because that reinforces the fantasy of being in yeah. space to me. So I think to me the fear is that I think this is what they're doing a good job of addressing because sometimes it's fine if ice balls aren't fun. But in the hands of, let's say, uh, a very early version of No Man's Sky or in the hands of what people, the worst case scenario, let's say, you would have a thousand boring ice balls and then some system would come in and go, go pick up random item on random ice ball 
and they then they say that's content. Well, I certainly that's think that's what people that are afraid of in an RPG with the systems of Bethesda RPG. Yeah, not a survival game like No Man's Sky. Yeah. I think there's a lot more potential for it to feel okay here instead yeah. of because I mean, man, yeah, No Man's Sky felt really rough on launch. But he said we'd rather have them uh, have these you know boring ice balls and say to you. Yeah, you can land on the ice ball. Here's some resources. You can survey it. Uh, then, you know, you can land on it, spend 10 minutes, have a look at the scenes, the sites, see what the universe actually looks like, and then say, okay, I'm going to leave and go back uh, to the planet with the content on it, and I can do a quest line. I think it's just the idea of having that little bit of freedom, that little bit of room to breathe. As we yeah. talked about yesterday. The room to breathe is so important. Pissing. I think. Yeah, pacing. You can think of games maybe that you've played where it's all just felt like so dense and cramped that it does. It just feels artificial. It doesn't feel real. But then you look at, say, some of the Bethesda RPGs that people love, and there's just a big, boring, empty field and a cool vista and a cool mountain way over there in the distance. And the fact that it's spread out and there's some negative space and some room to breathe means the things you do feel more meaningful, it means it actually feels like an adventure. I would hope that these will make it feel like a space adventure. So Todd says they're basically careful about saying, here's where the fun is. Here's this kind of content, but still say yes to the player. You can go and land on that weird planet, check it out, build an outpost, live your life there, and watch the sunset because you like the view of the moons. Go for it. We love that stuff. I think it's that aspect of player freedom. In a game like this, I am the player who would probably like to find the planet that I think is the coolest and the coolest spot on that planet that I can then go and build a cool little outpost on because that is part of the space role-playing fantasy to me. For other things then, you may be wondering about what's the content of this game. Well, you made specific mention of a classic Bethesda style uh, story. Um, You know, the sorts of things that people want. So to go through some of these content things. There's four main cities in the game. New Atlantis, which is the one they showed off more in the gameplay trailer, is the biggest city they've ever built. Here's New Atlantis. I mean, that looks pretty dope. I am totally down for that. So... And even just seeing there's the more cyberpunkish looking place, it seems like there's a nice amount of variety in that. Um, so he's saying, like, in terms of what content we're going to expect in a city like this, all the services you would expect, you can work in your ship there, the factions will be there. Um, there's also the headquarters of Constellation, which is the faction that you join that's essentially the last group of space explorers. Basically, NASA meets Indiana Jones meets League of uh, Extraordinary Gentlemen. Um, And that is really where you're doing the main quest through this group where you're essentially kind of finding these ancient artifacts. There's visions, exploring the galaxy in a fairly hefty way. Uh, Now, of course, you know, you think about say, oh, you're you're on a planet, you're Commander Shepard, you touch an artifact, you have a vision and then three video games happen. (laughs) So who knows where their storyline is going to go? Um, I mean, if it's artifacts, then we're probably going to be going to some, you know, Janitor, some maybe old and fallen civilization. Uh, Fallen civilization, which, to be honest, is a little bit dumb. But if they can cover that with a world that feels unique, with lore that feels unique, it could actually work. You know, I I would hate to have a really good story with all the progenitor stuff be, uh, you know, messed up because a bunch of other people have done it kind of badly. Or maybe in the case of Halo, have built cool lore, but not done a great job of actually telling that to the players. Mm. It's okay, Halo book fans. I know you guys know. Uh, But... Obviously, our you know the game people have have struggled a bit. And, you know, 343 haven't done the best job. Uh, now then, so actually, apparently, this game is longer than the other ones. They may tune that still, but it has more quests. It might be about twenty percent more than their previous games. Yeah, I think that's I think that's kind of the core of it, right? People people want their big game to be a quality big game. Yeah, and everything that obviously it's Todd talking interview. People will laugh all they want. But everything they pointed out seems they they're actually kind of aware of that. They kind of understand that their games are a bit too big, and they have to make them actually good to match the big. Yes, and hopefully that actually goes completely through. Yeah, and then IGN point out if you go to how long to beat uh, Skyrim Special Edition is about twenty five and a half hours on main quest. Fallout Four is about twenty seven. Uh, I can't attest to Fallout Four because I very no. much bounced off it. Same on Skyrim. I think most of the fun was felt outside of that main quest. So. If they can evolve meaningfully in that main quest, but more is falling outside of it, then I think yeah. we're still looking in a good place. Well, even then, like I was just thinking, the idea of the NASA meets Indiana Jones meets League of Extraordinary Gentlemen looking for artifacts, that's the perfect frame and you need to, you like, you need the main quest to kind of set that up. But then you just have this massive open-ended bit in the middle where it's like, you're just treasure hunting now or you're artifact hunting. And that could be, you know, kind of, I guess a little bit Wind Waker-y style, 
go find the parts of the Triforce. That's really annoying. But, you know, it's a capped quest to find stuff. Or it could just be, hey, just go grab all the artifacts. There's literally thousands of them. You know, there's hundreds across all the planets. Go have a look-see. And then I could maybe evoke a little bit of the... You're going to places that don't really feel like they have anything in them. In the kind of Breath of the Wild way of you can't assume something's there. But you go anyway because movement and exploration is quite yeah. nice. And then you find a shrine and it's, you know, obviously they weren't super interesting. But they were kind of, they were cool little bits and you got something for them. So there is that whole idea of even just that as a basic setup means that they could just have a lot of, a lot of fun. If they know how yeah, to do it. Yeah, they could. And another interesting thing here is modding, where um, oh, yeah. just, you know, modding post-launch. So, of course, Howard confirmed, yes, post-launch content, as they do. And also, they're extremely excited for modding. They think this game will be a dream. And I guess if you're thinking about the way it's working with the proc Gen planets, maybe you like the planet of Solace from Star Wars Battlefront 1, and you just want Iceland to be in the game. And maybe Iceland is not in the game at launch. Well, if people, if modders can actually have some fun with the procedural generation, oh shit, right? Yeah. So I think there is a pretty cool potential here. And I think just because there is an inherent modularity to planet, planetoid, satellite-based content, I think it means that modders will be able to quite seamlessly integrate just little modules of content uh, into this into this game. So yeah. that's all exciting to me. <laughs> the idea of just, hey, here's a barren planet. Get the mod to unbarren it, sort of. Well, even just the idea of theme planets. This is a yeah. thing, you know, for a very long time in science fiction. You just do a theme planet, and sometimes it can be fun hijinks. Uh, people, I think, would be readily able to do that. Yeah. Now, No Man's Sky comparisons. So some of this was uh, talked about, and here's the first one. People have asked, can you fly the ship straight down to the planet? No. I wasn't sure about that yesterday. I'm sure about it now. We decided early in the project that unsur on surface is one reality, and then space is another reality. He said that if you're trying, to, if you're really spending a lot of time engineering the in-between, like the Segway, you're spending a ton of time in something that's not that important to the player. Uh, so let's make sure it's awesome when you're in the surface, then awesome in space, make them as good as it can be. Now, this is the sort of thing, I'm actually not the player he's talking about there. I do value the transition, but also I do have a little bit of uh, an understanding of how much of a pain in the ass that can be. So in Star Citizen, essentially... You run into precision problems with numbers. Yeah. So you need to make some pretty fundamental technological changes if you are going to be having, like, I, you could almost say the same scale system between your planet and just space in general so that you can just fly down into that planet. That's one of the things that, like, Star Citizen has got super incredibly, and that's, like, some ultra-cool hardcore engineering, but it also does come with quite a few, uh, you know, with quite a few trade-offs. It's going to be harder to make that game super performant. You're a little bit more tied into one size fits all things. Whereas with the way that they've chosen to done this or to do this, space is specific, land is specific. You can tailor whatever to make sure they're both optimized. Yeah. Now that said, we're talking about Bethesda game. I just said the word optimized, so I've probably yeah. just jinxed it. Well, I mean, here's a different way to look at it, right? So you've got a physics bug in the Bethesda game. Say you've got your static paintbrushes from Oblivion, so you can just climb paintbrushes. If they did have planet landing and it was a very clean, these are same game world stuff, then you could just climb the paintbrushes to space. Someone would and make that a sounds cool, but also if you're talking, think about like say Halo Infinite's kind of movement mechanics when it comes to grappling hooking something. All you know is, you know, you get a paintbrush on a bucket, you stand on the right way, suddenly you're flying through space on top of a bucket. And while that sounds cool, I think for a lot of players who encounter that accidentally, it would probably be more of a problem overall. Yes, I would love to have a space elevator made out of cheese wheels, but probably not going to yeah, happen. I mean, the idea of Bethesda just going, we know this is all, we know our reputation, we know we have made some really, really janky shit in the past. Maybe we should go out of our way to not outscope our ability to keep it reasonably sane. And on that topic, so it's often weird, sometimes you'll have a Call of Duty Infinite Warfare where suddenly the shooter people are making space combat. Yay. And it's all like, whoa, <laughs> this is not the thing you normally do. So, of course, Bethesda, vehicles, vehicle combat, spaceships. Oh boy, this is a lot of things to think about. This is a lot of uh, new things for the studio to tackle. Now, I'll say that while it didn't look like it was the most like uber heart, you know, your heart rate's going to explode, uh, hyper in-depth thing, I thought that it did look pretty neat and pretty visceral, Oops, especially yeah. considering that it's a ship that you yourself 
build modularly, which just, I think, makes it inherently so much more satisfying. But to give us a little bit more uh, detail on the combat system, Todd actually said that they looked a lot of the pacing of MechWarrior. And that's interesting. <laughs> and I think yeah. if you're making a game like this, you don't really want players to be running around in small, kind of like little strike fighter craft that are hyper nimble, hyper agile. I mean, it would be awesome if you could do that. But I think they're probably wanting something a little bit bigger with like inherently less of a Twitch skill requirement. So yeah. he's basically saying it's probably a bit slower. But I think what it then does do, as he says, is that in terms of systems and power, they can kind of... You know, it's not a twitchy dogfighter, but you do have those things to manage, which overall does mean that like it's an engaging experience instead of just being slow. Um, as Mac Warrior shows us, that can work, so hopefully it works here. Now, your ship's got various power systems, uh, a little bit of the game FTL. If you've never played the indie game FTL, it is awesome. I love it. Fantastic. So, you know, you're putting power into different subsystems, right? So put some more power into your weapons, into your shields, things like that, um, you know, to help you kind of like tailor how your ship is performing for yeah. the situation you're in yeah that's exactly to me almost the thing of like he talks about you know always wanting to say yes to people who's like hey can we do this yes you can do this and to me that's like such a fundamental part of the space combat fantasy in a ship and it yeah. always has been across all of sci-fi you always you know divert power to shields you always know that you, you hear that everywhere it's just one of those cultural kind of iconic ideas so yeah. it's a case of does it need to be this super well-designed, extremely high-quality combat loop? No. Nothing of Bethesda has ever had to be that because they get you to feel something as opposed to yeah. get you super yeah. into flow and combat. And that's exactly it. It's like, does it need to be insane? No. Does it need to be there? Yes. The nuts and bolts of the fantasy have to work. And a perfect yeah. example of this is what Star Citizen lets you do mm -hmm. because stuff in that game is so physical. I know people roll their eyes at Star Citizen. Mm. They have achieved pretty incredible gameplay things. A lot of criticisms about the project, what their actual like engineers, artists, gameplay designers, etc. Uh, make awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so when you're playing that game, right, you know you can fly, disable an enemy ship, open the door of your ship, and assuming you've got you know your combat suit and your spacesuit on, EVA over to their ship, and let's just say you've like blasted off like a, I don't know, a piece of a door or whatever, um, you can then board their ship, shoot them, kill them pick their shit up, and then EVA back to your own ship, pop it in the cargo hold, and go along your merry way. Mm. It is just fundamentally really cool that that's possible. Yeah. And one of the neat things here is that's actually happening in this game. I didn't expect that. So he says, it's not just dogfighting. The ship stuff includes, uh, you can see in the video, is you can dock with other ships, you can disable them, you can dock into a ship and board it. There's actually some quests that involve that. You can steal the ship. There's dialogue in space, star sp uh, stations you can visit. There's smuggling. Now, of course, if we just think about doing some work with the Thieves Guild yeah. in, in Skyrim, it obviously has a certain set of limitations. Here, there's a whole new design space. The, the, you know, if you want to get that smuggler feel, like I suppose for some people, uh, maybe it's a Davos Seaworth, or if you're going to go in space, uh, you kind of can't avoid the Star Wars Han Solo thing, can you? Yeah. So you'll be able to do that. I mean, hey, if you want to just recreate the Serenity, I think you'll be able to do that too. I mean, for a lot of people, that's the fantasy box they just want to have ticked. Yeah, I mean, even you talking about the kind of thieves guild equivalent the idea of smuggling yourself onto a spaceship and hijacking it is just really cool especially because it's in space as opposed to anything else because obviously like thieves guild stuff is usually steal from a house steal from a ruin you know something like that obviously well i suppose the, the oblivion stuff is really good with the gray fox bits but anyway yeah just that idea of the fantasy of what you can do in space is something they've kind of tried to adhere to and i can see why it's why they spent so much so much time on this game Oh, oh yeah, so like, I'll straight up admit, I'm extremely excited for this. It's also yeah. a game that's targeted to me, and as much as I am very cynical, I'm not cynical to the point of actively wanting things to fail as soon as they are <laughs> announced, because it's satisfying in the moment. Oh, I wish I had that control. <laughs> Which actually does seem to be uh, a lot of people, and I think that's yeah. one of the sad things. The industry has made, you know, so many fuck-ups and so many false promises. That is how people think, and it's like, sometimes you can blame them for it, but also you think, why do they think that? Oh, it's because they've constantly been sold down the river by glitzy press events Yeah, we that look and feel like this one. Yeah, because we want to root against the bad guys because they are making themselves the villains all the time. And that's where Todd Hard rides a very interesting line because everyone's, you know, don't believe his lies. You know, 
that sweet little lies version of the, yeah, the music can, video. Can he become American? Uh, oh, your man, no man, sky man. Oh, uh, Sean. Uh, yeah, Sean Murray. Yeah. Can he become American Sean uh, Murray? Probably not in any word close to the same way, but in the idea of if Starfield comes out and everyone ha- everyone gets to go, oh, the pictures of, you know, don't believe his lies, they were uncalled for in retrospect. They're like, shit, damn, nice one. That's and it. honestly, because the next segment here we have to talk about is, did this change the community feeling? And my answer is actually quite profoundly yes. <laughs> Because I was expecting this to be... I mean, obviously, I don't exactly trust super hype machines. But based on what they've literally shown, and in terms of how they're talking about the fantasy, and how I've engaged with Bethesda games before, the almost like the Japanese idea of a kusoge. It's like the shittiness of the game makes it sometimes. And as long as the game is shitty, but you still have that fantasy element to it. And it seems like they're super heavily leaning into this, especially compared to Fallout 4. Where, yeah. with the whole idea of, hey, we've got this main quest, hey, we've got this voice character, it seems like they maybe got a wee bit up their own holes and thought, maybe we're really good at making super convincing, excellent RPG main quests. And then everyone's like, where, where did you get that idea from? Well, I think what Who happens told you is that? <laughs> they look at New Vegas. Maybe, yeah. And they think like, oh, damn, Obsidian really one up us there in the story. We'll give Maybe. it a shot. Yeah. And they try really hard, but they end up being a wee bit misguided. Mm-hmm. Um, before the community bit, just a few little things. So okay. Todd did confirm the obvious. Elder Scrolls Six is in pre-production. Nice. As for what pre-production will mean in a context like this, it will mean trying to work out what does the world look like? What are the factions in this game? What is the broad storyline? What sort of characters will we have? What are the technological requirements of this? It will be making little, you know, vertical slices that, uh, you know, people in the team can be like, okay, this is the thing we need to achieve. That's what pre-production will be like. It is usually done with a significantly smaller team than the core production team. So usually you'll just have a whole load of seniors and their kind of small crack team working to just lay in, you know, this is... When the team size now increases four, five, six, seven times, this is what we're going to be building. So that's what that means. So that is a form of active development pre-production. I think sometimes people think that that is just some people are thinking about the story and doing some concept art. No, there's a lot more. Um, He did say it's Fallout 5 after that. So suffice to say, they're just going to be busy for a while. Um, Now, Elder Scrolls 6 has been in pre-production, you know, for a long time. They announced it in 2018. um, But that's actually... You know, in a way, I'd say that's that's a good thing. Mm. Hopefully, it's going to mean whenever they do fully move their production capacity on to the next Elder Scrolls, they'll just have so much work yeah. done already. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. You don't want them to be working on the Elder Scrolls 6 now before they've figured out what they've done wrong with Starfield. You want Starfield to be fully realized as a product and then to go, okay, we see the community reaction. We see our critics reacted. We know what we've done wrong. Let's not do that again. Yeah. So, for the community feeling... What we basically saw, just taking a quick uh, skim around the Reddit specifically for this game, what you see is happy people, I would say happy people, who are very much, uh, you know, similar sentiment to me, right? When you go sort of generally uh, in in the internet, well, um, what's the picture out there, Matt? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to say because there's, there's all so much bad faith engagement with Bethesda because they are the laughing stock and they are the villains of so many people. But I think it's a case of they need to win the skeptics over as opposed to win the cynics over. They need to largely win the skeptics over. And I think they're doing that, especially with this response. There's definitely like at least a couple of people going, okay, right. We did a fears procedural. You've said you've this is the most handcrafted content of any game. Well, just your handcrafting might be shit, but at least you're trying. At least you're not falling into the mistakes that we would expect it of you. And it's almost like the 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 worst case opinion came in, the worst case cynicism came in, and then there's an immediate rebuttal. So I was like, oh, okay, okay, okay. We'll give you some benefit of the doubt. But between that and all the other stuff, obviously when it comes to a game as big as Starfield, it's very difficult to get a view of the picture because there are so many screaming voices in the void that is the the internet and Twitter and whatnot. But generally speaking, I think that's a... The more they communicate, the better. And as long as they don't tell straight-faced lies. I don't, yeah. th- I don't think they will. I don't think they will at all. I think the important thing with this is... And I suppose, right, like they did do this with Fallout as well. And it's not like it always helped there. But they are communicating this reasonably close to launch. 
that does mean that, I mean, right now, they will have content and system lock on this game, for yeah. sure. So, I think that just means whatever Todd's saying, like, is it's prob it's almost certainly in the game right now. The only thing will be, are any of, just any of these elements things where they are 95% sure it's going to work? But there is some, you know, random insurmountable problem. Yeah. I would imagine those sorts of issues don't exist in the project anymore, given that it's been worked on for such a long time. You'd hope so, yeah. And that this is all being communicated vaguely close, not only to its original launch window, but, uh, of course, to the updated launch window. Uh, I think the expectation is that change in launch window is primarily for uh, bug fixing and polish. I think likely understanding that, yeah, they have the reputation for a reason, and perhaps Microsoft themselves offering them a little bit more uh, latitude. Microsoft yeah. have obviously in recent times shown more of a willingness to delay things in the name of overall long, you know, the long run. Yeah, and as to how well that's happened so far, it's hard to say because they haven't had a surefire win, but I mean, I, I know the quote is misattributed to Shigeru Miyamoto, but you know, a, a bad game's a bad game is a bad game, delayed game is eventually good kind of thing. That's not definitely not true in any capacity, but on average it kind of holds. It kind yeah, of holds. The, the the vibe is right, the feel is right. Yeah, you can you can fix a decent amount of bugs with a couple of months, basically. So, to end it, Matt, out yep. of ten, where's your Okay, I don't want to say hype meter because of all yeah. the uh, you know, Titanfall, believe the hype yeah. uh, sort of things <laughs> that but your your excitement mm. meter not as a talking internet person, yes. as a player of video games, where's your excitement meter for this game? Uh, it was profoundly out of four until I saw the interview today and all the footage. And now it's probably at, and this is, I really don't care about this kind of game at all. I don't really like space video games. I like sci-fi and stuff, but I don't really like space video games very much. I don't like the fantasy. I like very tightly controlled. Basically, I've discovered any game that isn't a character action game, I don't care anymore. That's what I've learned. But I'm now sitting at a, I will almost definitely play Starfield for at least all of the content. And I'm pretty hyped for it overall. It's probably about a seven or an eight. I was a six. Yeah. I think I'm now a nine. Nice. Might even be a nine and a half. Very good. To what I enjoy in a video game, this is uh, like an Elden Ring tier concept. Now, yeah, I am not yeah. expecting an Elden Ring tier delivery on no. that concept. <laughs> uh, and that is why I said personal excitement, not official, professional on camera uh, uh, yeah. final score. Yeah, don't put that in the back of the box, Bethesda. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but hey, let's hope it's great because if the next Bethesda RPG can uh, delight us in the same way that Oblivion, Fallout 3, Skyrim did then that's fantastic. It proves that Fallout 4, which, by the way, is still a game that a lot of people do really like, mm -hmm. um, but it was a, li a little bit of a blip, I think most people would say. Um, so for this game to come out and actually be at least better than that, it shows that Fallout 4 was a blip, and they still got it. Yep. And if they don't, we get 10 years of laughing before they get the next game out, so it's a win-win, honestly. Th that's it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, will the official tie-in merchandise jacket... Uh, basically be made with a tarp or will it be made with pleather? Who knows? Fallout uh, 76 is anything to go by. That'll be content. Yeah. Anyway, have a great day. Let me know what you're thinking about this game. See you next time.